most of us sell out our true natures and join the culture and then we wander around feeling weirdly divided from ourselves mm. and integrity is the way back hello and welcome to the psychology podcast today we welcome martha beck on the show martha is a new york times best-selling author life coach and speaker she holds three harvard degrees in social science oprah winfrey has called her quote one of the smartest women i know martha is a passionate and engaging teacher and coach known for her unique combination of science humor and spirituality her newest book is called the way of integrity finding the path to your true self in this episode, I talked to Martha Beck about integrity. According to Martha, we are all born true to ourselves with our integrity intact, but then we lose sight of who we are because we try so hard to fit into our society. Martha shares advice on how to live authentically in a culture that doesn't necessarily share the same values as you. We also touch on the topics of neurodiversity, emotions, coaching, and transcendence. Martha is one of the best coaches alive on this planet. And it was such an honor to chat with her on this podcast and to gain her unique wisdom on integrity and living a life of authenticity and purpose. She's just such a delight. So without further ado, I bring you Martha Beck. Martha! Hello! I love your podcast. I love your books. I've been a fan of yours. That I, I was stunned when I realized it was you doing the interview. I was like, oh my! Are you serious? I had no idea that the great Martha Beck even knew I existed. Are you kidding? I am. I am. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I loved Wired to Create. I love Transcend. I'm like, I'm, I just wrote a book proposal where I leaned quite heavily on Transcend and my agent said, look, not everyone is as excited about Maslow as you are. <laughs> so I was like, well, they should be because this is awesome. They stuff. should be. Well, that made my day. So thank wow. you so much. And I, I, I know we have a, a mutual friend, Andrew Mangino, mm -hmm. and uh, he speaks so highly of you. Ah, oh, he's a, he's amazing. He's amazing. Yeah. I was just so I was so I'm just so excited to get you on this show and and just oh, to chat. Yeah. You know, we have very formal chats. You know, there don't feel the need. You know, you you know just come as you are. You know, and uh, we'll just sort of riff. And um, I loved your I loved uh, your most recent book on integrity, of course. And I, I oh, love all your you. books. But um, can we talk a little bit about you know what's your motivation? What why did you get into the field of coaching? You know, how did that mm. how did that start? What's the backstory there? It was a complete accident. I literally tripped and fell into it. <laughs> I, was oh, wow. teaching, I was teaching um, multinational business management at Thunderbird Business School in Phoenix, where I lived. And I developed a career class to help the, the business school students there. And uh, they really, really liked it. And then they started asking me to just talk to them outside of class. I said, well, I'm not a therapist. Mm. They're like, no, no, no. We just want to talk about... So I started calling it life design and I started hmm. doing it. And then like I'd been doing it for four or five years, but still didn't have a name for it. And then I was on a plane and I, I opened USA Today and they were naming me as one of the best known life coaches in America. And I was like, wow. what's, a, what's a life coach? That sounds, you didn't even see yourself that way. Oh my yeah. gosh, no. I was yeah. like, that sounds yeah. dumb. <laughs> Sorry, all you coaches out there. I no longer think that. That is so funny. That must be so surreal, though, to see a headline of, of how the world perceives you. Oh my gosh. Right? And that's not how you had perceived yourself. I just think that's really interesting. It really was. And it was another lesson in the fact that the way the world sees you really has nothing to do with who you are or how you feel inside. But I was very, you know, I was thrilled to be that. <laughs> it's just yeah. other papers have said things about me that weren't as complimentary. So I've learned to take it all with a grain of salt. And you have a degree in sociology. Is that right? I do. I, yeah, I have three Harvard degrees, actually. And um, they're counting, in, really. Yeah, I was counting. <laughs> yes. All, all my friends play drinking games whenever I mention that. And they're perpetually plastered. No, they... <laughs> they drink water, but they do have a drinking game. I'm not even kidding. That's impressive. Um, so, but sociology is just one then. What are the other two? My undergraduate degree was in East Asian languages and civilization. So I was a Chinese major, basically. 
Yeah, because I'm so obviously Chinese by heritage. And uh, oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought, well, that sounds weird. I'm going to take that. I mean, for a girl from Utah, I want to learn Chinese. That's what I want to do. And yeah. the others are in uh, sociology, socioeconomic development. I thought about psychology, but at the time I was at Harvard, if you studied psychology, it was you and a rat alone in a lab. Mm -hmm. And if you brought another person yeah. in, it immediately became sociology. So that's where I went. I mean, this wasn't when Skinner was there, was it? Well, not when he was there, there. I saw him once right, in the right. elevator. But I'm not as old as B.F. Skinner. A surprise. Right. Well, uh, I know that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible maybe you were a young t a Turk, you know, when he was very old. <laughs> yeah, I was 17 and he was very old, but they were still swimming rats around. I told a story in one of my books that I had a friend who was swimming rats around in a solution of um, powdered milk and water with electrodes in their brains. And the pool, she used this little pool that was for kids. It was called a, a Smurf pool because it had the cartoon characters, the Smurfs on it. And uh, so one day I was so, I was up talking to her and I had a seminar one floor below in William James Hall and I, I was late. So I ran down there and there, there were all these uh, visiting professors that day. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I was, I was upstairs watching my friends swim rats around a Smurf pool. And they all started talking about Smurf and Smurf's work and how they'd read his latest articles. And I realized, <laughs> They thought it was like a Skinner box. B.F. Skinner made these boxes for uh, training pigeons and his daughter. And it was very, very benevolent. But he did keep his daughter in a Skinner box a lot of the time. So people thought that a Smurf pool was by Dr. Smurf. And everyone sat there talking about how what strides Smurf was making in psychology. That's so funny. That is so funny. Well, I know that you never intended to become a life coach and kind of fell into it. But the thing that seems to be underlying all of that is your your deep passion and interest in eliminating human suffering by any yes. means available. Um, yes. But at, at, good, okay, good, a confirmation on that. There's so confirmed. Yes. But you get a you get it in in lots of different ways, right? So you yeah. do. I love how you draw on brain science. I love how you draw on you know my field of psychology, but you also um, draw a lot on timeless spiritual texts. Yeah. And um, animal videos on YouTube. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's not just human right? suffering I would like to eliminate. I don't like the idea of any any being suffering. And so, yeah, I, I entertain myself with watching otters play with rocks about an hour a day. <laughs> and the rest of it is science. The rest of it is me trying to help people. And you're right, I do draw on pretty much anything I can find. If it works... If it does alleviate suffering in any way, I want to know about it. So I've studied everything from shamanic practices to, as I said, Chinese, ancient Chinese philosophy, Asian philosophy in general, and all the wonderful things that Western psychology and science have been teaching us. It's, it's a fun time to be playing around in this field. It really is a fun time. Um, and the more, the more I dig into Eastern philosophy, historically even a you know, 200, 300, 400 years ago, the wisdom, mm -hmm. I realize, um, I'm like, what's the point of the scientists? Because I feel like in a lot of ways we keep just replicating and uh, we're like, we've discovered. <laughs> right, <laughs> we disco right. <laughs> well, what we've really discovered is what someone said like 400 years ago in, in, in China. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to justify, you know, being a scientist, you know, I don't feel like I get that many surprising findings. Now we still need to do the science to see what's, what's real and in, but uh, I, I, if I'm being honest, I can't say I, I get that many surprising findings uh, anymore, you know, where it's like, oh, my God, it turns out people don't want to be happy in their lives at all. <laughs> what? No, no. I mean, it's just, you know, they're just timeless truths, right? Well, I don't know. I think it's super exciting to find out, for example, that the, we, what we know about the neuroplasticity of the brain. I mean, everybody throughout history has known that people's minds can change, right? But to watch it happening with machines and see the different ways it happens. I ran out in the 90s and found a lab that would wire me up with one of the hats with the electrodes so that I could watch my own brain at work and learn to like move something, a cursor around a computer screen just by thinking different thoughts. And it was so, so bizarre because the thoughts that I thought would work didn't work. I was trying to bring down anxiety, for example, and I was wired up with my little hat trying not to blink because that would make the, the electrodes go crazy. 
And I thought, okay, I'm going to meditate. My theta waves went up, but my anxiety did not go down at all. I was just watching my anxiety. And then I started thinking just random thoughts. And I started thinking about dangerous situations. And my anxiety just dropped and dropped and dropped. Mm -hmm. And it dropped to zero when I thought about skiing in a blizzard with no visibility on the edge of a cliff or being live on Oprah. Those were zero anxiety. I would have taken a lot of years to figure that out if they hadn't had my fancy hat and my fabulous brain scientists there with me. And it really, it informed my knowledge and opinion about what happened when I meditated, for example, which is an ancient Asian practice and well, all over the world practice. I actually think that you're in it, you're in the, you know, you're sort of down in the clay and you're looking at little tiny advances because that's how scientists do it. But for those of us who are looking at it from a broad historical perspective, your books, I love your books. I think they're full of exciting new ideas. And those <laughs> ideas you. are old, old, old. I mean, Transcend is all about this yeah. ability to move beyond our suffering and into liberation. And that's that comes from all over the world. But it's so exciting to hear you say it. I have to say, it's. Uh, I love the fact that you defended uh, my field of psychology on the psychology podcast to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We, I love that that just happened. Um, I love that. <laughs> because I, I, you're right. You're right. You know what? You're right. Um, I, I like to, you know, you know, I like to play devil's advocate sometimes just for the fun of it. And you're a modest you know. man. Let's face it. Maybe, you know, maybe am, a little I too am. modest. And also, I must say my parietal lobe is not active this morning. Uh, if you look behind <laughs> me, uh, the lights blew out. <laughs> the lights blew out. I'm trying to get a replacement. I, I just ordered a replacement brain. <laughs> I love it. Get a parietal lobe, stick it through your ear. He'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I apologize for that. That that explains uh, why I was uh, critical of my field for a second there. So um, can I double click on something you said? Because maybe I'm not understanding it. That is a super fascinating finding that your anxiety levels were lower for these yep. really high stakes situations. What was the explanation for? Did I miss it? You didn't tell me that yet, did you? You may have noticed I have I have diagnosed ADD. That was one thing they diagnosed. They looked at my brain and said, holy smokes, you have ADD. <laughs> so that's why I'm watching <laughs> Otters with Rocks and I can't stick to the point and everything, but I don't suffer from mental illness. I enjoy it. So mm -hmm. because I my brain was jumping around, I was able to track, okay, here are the thoughts that bring it down. What do they have in common and what's the explanation? And it is, it is only when I am in an absolutely crucial situation where any mistake feels catastrophic that I am truly present without any wavering attention. Colk. Oh. That's what did it. Wow. Um, I, I think I can relate to that. Um, and, and actually my mom, uh, I don't really, maybe I shouldn't bring my mom into this, but uh, God bless her. I find that she uh, is so neurotic about every little tiny thing in the world. But to her credit, when an emergency happens, she yeah. goes into this like completely different state of like concentration and like, okay, let's get this, you know, sorted. But like, she'll worry about like the littlest, tiniest things yeah. like, every other second of her life. So it's just, it's just so interesting how that can happen. You mentioned uh, being on Oprah. Um, aren't you Oprah's coach? Uh, is, that, is that true? I wouldn't say I am. I mean, she would, I, I wrote for the magazine. I wrote for her magazine for almost its entire existence. I had a column every single month. And a lot of the topics came through people who had been talking to her and I would write directly to her. And she always wrote, she always told me that she read my articles first every month. And, oh. um, and she often thanked me for her insights and stuff, but it's not like I sat down and said, well, obviously your life sucks. So you need a life coach. <laughs> I was kind of watching her life to see how it works, frankly. <laughs> so I was Oprah's coach in the sense that I sort of belonged to her. She was my boss, but I was gotcha, never gotcha. like, I can help you, Oprah, with your problems. No, not that way. You may not have explicitly said that to her, but you did help her, you know? So that's um, maybe you're being too modest now. There was one time <laughs> when I just sort of said to her, you are exhausted nobody ever thought about how tired oprah must have been after she's like she never missed a show there was never a sub yeah. for oprah and um she was 
So I said, go rest, go rest. And she sent me a blanket, which I suppose Aww. was barter of a kind. She's so generous that you can't even give her wow. a bit of advice without getting something wonderful in, re in return, like a, a <laughs> present. Funny. And look on your chair. There's a blanket. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, no, I love, I love it. <laughs> I love that. And I have to say, I'm a little distracted with this painting behind you. Is, I love it. Oh, thank you. I'm intrigued by it. Um, can you kind of explain a little bit about it? So it's, yes. it's in a forest. Um, this is an audio, so a lot of people won't be able to see right. it unless they go on YouTube to watch this. But oh, they're in I'm a doing. forest. And there's and what I see is, is it like a, a father and a child? Nope. It's a woman and a pig. <laughs> <laughs> I am not even kidding. I can't see from this distance, but it's, this uh, I'm was, like, what is it? No, you can't, you shouldn't be able to see from a distance. Hang on. Okay. It's a woman I and a really wild like boar, more to the point. I see. Okay. Now, I, now I see it. Now Whoa. I see it. That is so cool. Yeah, I painted that yeah. as the cover yeah. for a novel I wrote. So you painted this painting? Yeah. It is my own painting. Wow. So you're... So you're an artist as well. Yeah, and I had I had a bunch of uh, autoimmune problems, and my hand stopped working for a couple of years, and it really it made me sort of change course and decide that I kind of had to work with my mind because that was the only thing that wasn't falling apart. The book is about a woman who gets lost in a forest, and I found one fact in my YouTube ramblings that I think all your listeners need to know, and that is that if you take a farm-raised pig, little pink pig, put it out in the forest, let it fend for itself, it will revert into a wild boar. It'll grow oh. darker, it'll get shaggy, it'll grow tusks. And if you, in the same individual creature, this is not evolutionary, it's a, it must be epigenetic, I don't know. Anyway, I use that as a metaphor for regaining our wildness, for being like, we're kept in, in little pens and society puts many, many pressures on us. And we lose our true nature. We become docile and like easy to deal with, but that's not what's in us. So she goes out to the forest and she goes wild herself and the pig goes wild. And yeah, it's a whole thing about re regaining our, nat our natural selves. Uh, now, I describe myself as a wild introvert. That's, really? that's my uh, description. Yes, that's the Can description I be one of myself. Too? That's perfect. I've never heard the phrase. I'm, Thank you. I'm trying to like coin this. It resonated with a lot of people when I, I came out as a wild introvert. People were like, that's me too. You know, I, I'm definitely wild in, inside. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, just, I need a lot of rest. I need a lot of rest. I am also a wild introvert. I love that. I mean, consider it coined. That is brilliant. And I will yeah. credit you for at least a year and then I'll forget. Um, but yeah, yeah. here's the thing. I'm a wild introvert, but I'm also... And I need a lot of rest, but I'm also not culturally cooperative. So introvert means I like to be away from people a lot. I like to go to the forests myself, but it doesn't mean that I'm not willing to be weird. I don't care if people think totally. I'm weird. And this yeah. means that my wildness can come out more, I think. So is I your introversion, so well. does your introversion make you co-op, does it make you cooperate? with social norms or is it just no not at all oh good it's agnostic to that yeah what's well, agnostic to that yeah, yeah I love absolutely it. yeah yeah the trauma loss and uncertainty of our world have led many of us to ask life's biggest questions such as who are we what is our highest purpose and how do we not only live through but thrive in the wake of tragedy division and challenges to our fundamental way of living to help us all address these questions, process what this unique time in human history has meant for us personally and collectively, and emerge whole, I've collaborated with my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jordan Feingold, MD, to bring you our forthcoming book. It's called Choose Growth, a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. It's a workbook designed to guide you on a journey of committing to growth and the pursuit of self-actualization every day. It's chock full of research from humanistic psychology, positive psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, cognitive science, and neuropsychology. So lots of themes that you hear about on this podcast. And it's aimed to help us all integrate the many facets of ourselves and co-create our new normal with a renewed sense of strength, vitality, and hope. Whether you're healing from loss, adapting to the new normal, 
or simply looking ahead to life's next chapter, Choose Growth will help steer you there to deeper connection to your values, your life vision, and ultimately your most authentic self. Choose Growth will officially hit the shelves September 13th, and you can order your copy or the audiobook in the U.S. now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and all major retailers. If you're in the UK and Commonwealth, you can order now at bookshop.org.uk. We truly hope this book helps you grow and thrive and become your best self. Okay, now back to the show. Well, maybe this would be a nice segue into um, into a whole rich discussion we can have about integrity, mm. uh, an area of mutual interest to both of ours. Um, but I loved your book, The Way of Integrity. Oh, um, thank you. And I heard somewhere that you almost called the book Undivided. I th- uh-huh. That's true, right? You almost yeah. called it Undivided. And I see why. I see why. Yeah, because that's so core to your definition of integrity, right? Yeah. Uh, the whole, the word integrity just means intact. It doesn't mean, there's sort of a virtuous Sunday school sort of nuance to it that is taken on in English, but it really just means being one thing, not divided. So we're all born in perfect integrity and we have a genetic predisposition and then we have a culture around us, a family culture, you know, um, religious, ethnic, national, all these different levels of culture. And before we can even talk, we basically sell out our true nature to be <laughs> more like what people want us to be, which is cultural. And that all also is inherent, our incredible susceptibility to socialization. And it's fine as long as it, does, it doesn't really pull us away from who we are in our essence. But I would think that most people, certainly by the time they're an adult, would have confronted social pressures that pulled them away from something that was very, very essential to them. And most of us sell out our true natures and join the culture. And then we wander around feeling weirdly divided from ourselves. Mm. And integrity is the way back. Wow. Um, Look, there's some interesting connections here between your writings about integrity and how the humanistic psychologists thought about integrity, especially the book, The Insane Society by Mm -hmm. Eric Mm -hmm, mm Fromm. I think that he really... He views authenticity, which is right, a related that was his concept. Word. Yeah. Authenticity as being uh, true to your values, especially in environments that challenge it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, what does it mean to be happy when everyone else around you is unhappy? Isn't that the highest mark of insanity? Depends on who's defining it. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, you know, if like you're in a, you know, in, in an environment where everyone is being killed around you and dying, you know, and uh, and you're part of the problem. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and you're like, I'm happy. I'm being authentic. You know. It's anyway. Um, he wrote a lot about that, and uh, it just it just dawned on me that there's a. I think that there's a relationship there because he very much viewed the, the environment and your relationship to the environment as essential to authenticity. Well, I think pretty much as you said earlier, all these concepts have been done in a, from a million different directions, right? So mm-hmm. if you look at any great psychologist, I mean, even Freud with the ego, the id, super ego mm-hmm. thing. I mean. It, It's kind of about achieving harmony between these unlike parts. So I think everybody's sort of feeling for the concept of making the psyche whole, uh, making a Mm. life whole, and intact integrity is just another way to say it. Yeah, and uh, and even to, I'll throw another phrase into here, Uh, Maslow talked about synergy. Um, which I think is what you talk about. It, it, inner and outer world simply works, you know, being in harmony with each other. Maslow said, what is good for you is automatically good for the world. And, and that's what he uh, viewed as synergy, which he actually got from Ruth Benedict, uh, the uh, the anthropologist. We should give her some credit. She was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Love, she talked I about synergistic her. cultures. Yeah, yeah. She talked about synergistic cultures, and then Maslow adapted that phrase huh. to talk about he, individuals who are synergistic with their environment. Yeah. Fabulous. Anyway, what, I'm going on too much here. <laughs> no, it's awesome. And it's a point of faith that if what, what is good for me is good for you, and that's a huge schism in, in Western knowledge, like is the, the natural state of man to be competitive and, and mutually destructive? Or can we say that if everyone went and became completely themselves, the world would benefit from it? And the, the conventional wisdom is that everybody would just take a bunch of stuff for themselves and destroy other people. And we have to rein in our, our natural impulses because they're destructive. You, me, 
Maslow, Ruth Benedict, and Eric Fromm, apparently, we all share this optimism that what's good for the individual is ultimately going to be good for the group and for the world. And like we've been going on the other assumption for a long time and things are not looking good. So maybe we should try the other way where we find ourselves instead of giving ourselves away. Yeah, part and parcel of, of so much of your writings as well is the notion, and you don't really necessarily use this phrase, but I'm going to use it, uh, people-pleasing. Mm -hmm. You know, you, talk, you do talk about pleasing our culture, this incessant drive to feel like your needs don't matter, and it's only, it's only the other, you have to serve, you know, completely, um, selflessly. I think that can be very dangerous, especially if you're a child and uh, you have parents who don't listen to your real felt needs. Carl yeah. Rogers talked about this a lot as, as important for developing into a fully functioning human is to individuate your, your own self. So yeah, talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I think I do use people pleasing in there a couple of Maybe times you do. in this book yeah. because it's, yeah. it's yeah. the same as what I'm calling I, duplicity. Where integrity mm -hmm. is one thing, duplicity is two things, and the duplicity that most of us suffer from has nothing to do with being bad. It's not that we're out of integrity because we are willful liars. It's always that we're trying to be good. We're trying so hard to be good. Even people who end up doing bad things are usually trying to please someone around them because the the propensity to be incredibly vulnerable to socialization is part of our genius. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, and we're so helpless and, and like completely dependent as infants that we'd better please the people around us because they have to get up in the middle of the night every night. These people are exhausted. <laughs> I don't know if you have kids, but no. Trust me, anyone raising a human infant is exhausted and it does them both good if the infant is really keyed in and going, okay, I want to figure out what's right for you and I want to become that. It helps them both survive. But there's a period maybe in toddlerhood where kids say no and they call it the terrible twos. And I think it's where the, the child is starting to recognize where he or she or they do not want to please the other people. And that can be either crushed out of us at that very moment, or it can be celebrated by parents and people around us who are interested in who we are. I've noticed, I've got this great educator from South Africa staying with me right now with her daughter. And what's so interesting to me about her is she never uses the word children or the word babies. She always says, little, uh, small people, little people. She, from the moment a child is born, that child is a person to her and they're sort of moving through the the stage where they have to finish gestating outside the womb because we're basically just plasma pets when we're born and then waiting as the child learns to talk and walk and do things to see who it is who has come mm -hmm. to visit and that curiosity and the dignity of calling an infant a person i've noticed that with people who are wonderful wonderful teachers and parents and I think our culture could really benefit from saying, yeah, the terrible twos are when the child says who he or she they, or they are. And it's an exciting thing to discover. I love that. I love that. I'm thinking about education. Uh, as my mind went when you were talking about this, because I'm really in favor of a human centered education system. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should stop calling them students. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we should call them humans. Yeah. I have a son with Down syndrome, and it, he's been a huge teacher of mine, uh, on, especially in integrity, because he will not say anything that's not true for him, and he will not, mm. he will do things that aren't things he wants to, but he will never lie to himself and say that he's doing it for his own good. <laughs> he knows he's doing it <laughs> to, you know, go along. But when he was born, people told me there are lots of therapies you can, they do early intervention with these kids now. You can teach them to almost act like other kids. And I thought, I, I knew he had Down syndrome for a couple of months before he was born. And people kept telling me things like this. And I thought, you know, if I went to the pet store for a puppy, because everybody has puppies, and I came home with a pet and it turned out to be a kitten, and mm. people would say, it's okay, it's okay, you can teach, you can work with these kittens, you can teach them to kind of bark, sort of wag their tails, you know, and I thought, well, what, what about, maybe cats are kind of cool, maybe I wait to see what the cat likes to do, and then it's okay that I have a cat and you have a dog, 
even if you don't think it's okay to have a cat, I am enjoying it. And that is another you know, thing about integrity. I read books saying, you will always be ashamed of your child. And I was like, mm, nah, don't think so. And I also didn't think that he was bad because he was different. He was just another kind of right. wild to me. Yes, yes. Well, I'm, I'm big into neurodiversity and, uh, and kind of just uh, appreciating that uh, all the different uh, things we have in the human genome. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, we have a lot. There's a lot there in the human genome. <laughs> you know, the yeah. wisdom of crowds, that weird principle yeah. from economics that if you, yeah. if you ask everybody in the room to guess how many beans there are in a barrel, the average answer of all the answers in the group will come closer to the truth than any individual answer. So the crowd is wiser than any one person in the crowd. But it's more true if the, if the crowd is diverse. So if you get a huge number of Harvard professors and have them guess, there's less diversity than if you throw in a few people with Down syndrome, right? Or, you know, mm -hmm. so getting that diversity makes us more intelligent as a group, as a, as a global mm -hmm. group. And I think that's one of the reasons, is, as you say, it might be nice to change education and start judging people along such a narrow band of abilities. Right. The only use they have is to be students to get good scores on a standardized test. Yeah. You know, is that it? That never did me uh, yeah. any damn good. Nothing. Nothing. I, I was very <laughs> yeah. pleased with my scores. Yeah. They did not translate to life skills. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Um, uh, okay. Well, what about uh, Dante's Divine Comedy? Why do you bring that into your work? Ah, because it's just such a knee slapper. Um, no, I read Dante, I read the, the Inferno when I was 18 mm. and very depressed. And there was this image of Dante going through hell and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse until he gets to the very center of hell where Lucifer, the fallen angel, is locked in a lake of ice. I remember thinking that lake of ice sounded very familiar to me. It, it feels like depression when you read about it. And his guide tells Dante, you have to keep going down. And he says, I'm as down as it gets. I'm at the center of the earth. And his guy says, no, no, you have to keep going down. So he, he finds a hole in the ice and he actually has to climb on the body of the monster to get down. And then he has to turn because he has passed the center of the earth. And now what was down has become up. So by going the mm -hmm. same direction, he emerges into a place where he can then climb toward paradise. And I read that at 18 and I recognized it. As, or maybe I just projected, but I thought that is a psychological metaphor. And it gave me this, uh, there was sort of a validation that if I kept going through my own suffering the way I was doing it, I was getting worse, but it was going, the only way out was through, right? Mm, and yeah. it worked. It worked. And then I read the whole Divine Comedy, and everybody reads Inferno, but nobody reads two-thirds of the epic poem that come after that one is purgatorio and the last is paradiso and the inferno is about how awful the world is once you get through that purgatorio is about once you've gotten through the horror of the the world once you've transcended to use a book from a word from your book there's still a lot of work to do you have to start actually doing in three dimensions in your real behavior what you've found to be true in yourself. So you have to, one metaphor would be, you have to be yourself with your parents, even if they don't like who you actually are. You have to defy the norms of your culture if your culture doesn't serve your truth. And that's what I think Purgatorio is about. And then the Paradiso is about once you've really, really gotten to the point where you are living your truth in every aspect of your life, something unbelievable happens and and dante says don't even try to understand this and then he goes on to describe an experience that is almost exactly like the experiences of awakening or enlightenment that i had read about from asian philosophers and i thought mm -hmm. oh dante did it too there is this thing called awakening or transcendence and people experience mm -hmm. it with similar um metaphors and symbols no matter where it happens in the world and i believe it to be the end of suffering i think the end of your psychotherapy is when you're enlightened 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> Do you think it's actually ever a state that anyone gets to, though, uh, as opposed to just a process? Oh, no, no, no. I think it's a state. Wow. If at, well, if you look at like Andrew Newberg's work that I've been following forever. Um, of course. He's a friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, my God. Would you <laughs> like tell him I'm a massive fangirl? I'll introduce you to each other. I'll, yeah, I'll make an intro. Oh, good heavens. I'm just rereading one of his books right now. Anyway, when, when he, uh, I don't know if he was one of the people who wired up those Tibetan monks, um, like yeah. younger Minger, uh, Yonge Minger Rinpoche, one, another one of my favorite people to read, a spiritual perspective, but he's probably spent more time meditating than anyone on earth. And when they wired up his brain and ha had him go to a state of compassion, it practically blew up the machine, right? There, yeah. there were two distinct parts of the brain, and you probably know the names of them off your, the cuff, but the uh, part that establishes self-other differentiation it seemed to go dormant. Well, funnily enough, part of the part of the parietal lobe that is dormant here on my, behind me right now. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that's yeah, so yeah. cool. Oh, I wonder yeah. if that's a coincidence. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then the other part is so there's self other differentiation, and then there's a sense yeah. of being in control, which is mm. probably I don't know. My friend Jill Taylor would say it's the left hippocampus is part of it. Anyway, mm. you lose the sensation of being separate in a body, and you, you lose the sensation of controlling what happens. Those two things, like I know so many people who would love to be enlightened and go beyond suffering. And then if you said to people, okay, that you will have to sen surrender two things, your sense of self and your sense of control, they, they would be like, okay, no. <laughs> we are so obsessed, especially in Western cultures, with you know, clarifying ourselves and getting our own things going. And we are so obsessed with controlling everything in our own lives, everything in the world. Mm. But what the enlightened people say is that after a certain period of introspection, meditation, what happens to Dante after he's gone deeply into his integrity is that the self falls away, the sense of self falls away. And what replaces it is this unbelievable connection with a felt sense of connection with the universe and yes the sense of control goes away but what what comes then is in chinese they call it wei wu wei which means to do without doing you become in a weird way a puppet operated by the benevolent force i mean the the absolute symbol of it for western culture is when luke skywalker is trying to destroy the death star and he hears obi-wan kenobi say Trust the force, Luke. Mm. Why do we love that so much? Because mm. when we put down the sense of control and the sense of self, there is a force that we experience, whether it's real or not, mm. is moot because it's perceived. Um, it's an experience that is real. And then the force works through us. And that is also extraordinarily blissful. So I think this has been happening to people all over the world in different cultures at different times. Some of them wrote it about it. Some of them didn't. But all those that did, I mean, there's a 12,000 year old story that came across the Bering Strait with some of the Native American peoples. It's called the tale of jumping mouse. That is one of the most powerful stories about enlightenment I've ever seen. It's been everywhere all through history. It's just not very common. But I think it could be. Mm, yeah, that's true. That's true. It's not very common. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, like expert meditators would tend to um, do have certain uh, neurological profiles. The happiest man in the world, Matthieu Ricard, um, they did scan his brain and found that he had a lot of uh, compassion, and they were able to distinguish that from empathy. Um, oh, cool! So that's really that's really cool because you know it, with empathy you can get burnout. Right, you can yes. burn out if you're in, if you're in the helping professions yeah. and you're always feeling what other people feel. You know, you can get exhausted. But but compassion should actually energize us to approach and help reduce suffering in the right way. Yeah. Okay. So what what is the idea of personal effectiveness then? Um, because you talk about that in your book and um and and maybe some techniques to become better at what we do. Better at what we do professionally. Better at what we do. What do you mean by personal effectiveness? Uh, I think it would be that we work toward 
the well-being of ourselves and others in whatever form that would take mm. and the the instigation of the the desire to do anything effectively has to come from authenticity from the the place where we are truly ourselves so the first thing it starts with is deciding what it means to be effective in your own life you have to know what it is you truly truly want so one of the things that i often say to clients is i ask them to write down things they want they come in and mm. you know life coaching do well financially whatever make a vision board they make lists of things they want and then i say all right now when you wake up at night alone in the dark what is it you yearn for and you can feel the like when you think about things like wanting a professional achievement it's it doesn't come from the same part of the body as the yearning for mm. um that beautiful warm presence you know with everything that that yeah. is body salt the whole thing when we yearn for other people it's deep for me it comes from my solar i feel it in my gut my solar plexus like mm -hmm. wants come from yeah, my I know, head i know what you mean but yeah. a yearning comes from my body and yeah the things that people really really yearn for are very similar and there it's a short list love is one of them having someone to love and to love you back uh, peace, nice. freedom, um, joy. That's kind of it. That's like that's, and I've been yeah. all over the world asking people if that's all we really want. So how do you move yourself toward what you yearn for? You find out what choices you make on an everyday basis, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. How do they affect the part of you that yearns? So mm. to be really effective is to be like an animal tracker. I love to go animal tracking. And yeah. uh, you find the track of the thing you're looking for in mm. the joy of your body, the tracks that you use, what would be footprints or whatever you're following in the wilderness. You find what you really want to track and you really define what that looks like. Before you track an animal, you have to know what its prints look like. Once you get that mm. really, really solidly in place, you start to begin to track this thing by the experience of joy in the body, uh, the sense of sort of settling into integrity. And here, let me tell you what it feels like. I call it a sense of peace, or sorry, a sense of truth. And mm. it's, the, it's the same thing that you feel when you solve a math equation and you know it's right, as it is when you go to the pound and get a dog and you know it's right that's your dog that's right that's what you need to do the same feeling of rightness and i've asked people all over the world to say different things and see if they got this ring of truth or chime of truth and the one sentence that i've found rings truest to everyone is the phrase i am meant to live in peace mm. so if you just repeat that or whoever's listening if you can repeat that silently in your mind I'm meant to live in peace it immediately mm. makes me take a deep breath it did yeah. yeah and then it drops you into a state of nervous system alignment where ah, there's a clarity there's an alignment of all the different parts of the self body heart mind spirit a lot of traditions divide it that way and they're all on the same path and they're looking for the same things. And from that sense of truth, everything you do is very, very effective. Wow. Do that. Wow. Can this help people in their lives who they feel like they're doing all the quote right things in their life, but that things are just not working as they expected? Um, something just feels off. You know, can some of these techniques help help them feel more whole in their lives? I could just type that up, put it out on a newsletter and say, this is what the way of integrity is about. Yeah, you absolutely nailed it. The people yeah. who are trying hardest, doing the best, getting the best grades and the best salaries and all the things, very often are the most lost. So in, at the very beginning of the Divine Comedy, Dante, he's, it starts out, in the middle of my life, I came to myself in a dark wood. He was lost. He was confused. He, he says the right way had been lost. He didn't remember getting there. He just felt mm. wrong. It just, he was scared all the time. He was unhappy. He was tired. He didn't feel good. 
and he didn't know how to get back. And then he sees rising out of the, the murky forest, this bright mountain. It's and it's the sun is shining on it. It's all golden. And he calls it Mount Delectable. And he sees all these people scrambling up toward the top and it looks fabulous. And he thinks that's the way out of here. And so he starts trying to climb. And to me, this is trying to climb up the pyramid of, of status, wealth and power in your culture. Like all those people are trying for that stuff. That must be the good stuff. I'm going to go for that. And you do really, really, really well. He, he gets so tired and he's animals keep attacking him and they have like mood state names like the sad the sad wolf there's a wolf that makes him super sad and a lion that makes him scared and a, a leopard that makes him ravenous anyway as he gets up the mountain it gets worse and what i found mm. as a coach is the most suffering i've ever seen has come from like people who just won an olympic gold medal People yeah. who just made a billion dollars, people who just got number one on the bestseller list. And I'm not, this is not hypothetical. These are real people. I've also I know homeless addicts on the streets and they have actually less suffering going on than that person who's sold out every ounce of his or her strength and time and will for some social goal that when you get there is not it's not deeply joyful in itself it's just what you were told would work and it doesn't it's so powerful so you said something so powerful just now you know you said um this idea of kind of uh using up all of your talent strengths you know that can also just feel so depleting and also like where do i go where do i go from here you know like uh, and then you also can have the pressure of like, oh, well, your next book has to be even better. And you're like, yep, well, what if yep, I don't yep. have it in me? You know, yep. I'm used up. So then does that mean I'm done? You know, my life yeah. is over. As a, There's something really energizing about being on the other side of potential where you feel like you have so much potential and you um, are on the journey. That's energizing. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It, doesn't, it seems depleting when, you're, when, you, when you reach it. <laughs> it nearly killed me. I mean, by the time I was... I, oh. I, the, by the time I was getting my third Harvard degree, I was so sick. I had all, I had drink, all these drinking game. <laughs> yes, yes, drink, drink. But I was looking around at the people who were, I mean, the pressure there is intense and everybody there is intense, right? They're all climbing Mount Delectable as hard as they can. It's not a criticism. I was climbing away too. But fortunately for me, my body gave out. And then what you just said about directionlessness, I think I made, I, I made a list of things that I call dark wood of error syndrome, things that make us feel like Dante waking up in the dark wood. And the very first thing was this loss of a sense of purpose. The number one thing people complain to me about is not, they can be sick, they can be miserable, but that losing your sense of purpose, it's like, why not just kill yourself then? Like they, it's really deep mm -hmm. suffering. And this really deep. Yeah. yeah. And if that goes on for a while and you don't change course, you get really negative moods depression, hostility, whatever. And if that doesn't work, your body will give out. You'll start to get sick. And there's lots of research showing that lying and secret keeping just incredibly um, increase physical illness because the body yeah. hates to lie. The body does not like to lie. That's true. That's so a good quote me, too. Yeah. By the time I was 29, I, I was literally just bedridden and couldn't move my hands, couldn't I was a, an absolute mess. I had all these diseases and I just decided I can't, I can't do this anymore. I have to find what gives me some kind of physical relief from pain. And that was the first step toward integrity for me to move away from what gave me physical pain. So it, it's not just depleting. It's actually, it actually creates a, a very, very positive environment for illness and disability when we're pushing that hard for things that aren't ours well i'm so proud of you uh, <laughs> i'm so proud of you <laughs> that you uh, you, you. Uh, you really chose growth um and really and really did what it took to get out of that uh hell yeah i didn't really have that much of a choice it's kind of like yes i chose yeah. to pull my hand out of the fire so yeah it wasn't an option for me to not 
find my integrity and try to live it. I feel like I want to coach you right now, Martha Beck. Oh, please. Uh, you know, what is it What is it within you that can't give yourself a little bit of at least a pat on the back? For, oh, all uh, right. I'll do it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. A little bit of agency you did take in, in taking uh, and, and steering your own life is, is, it makes me very proud of you. Oh, thank um, you. you. You talk. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, well, in the book, this I want to reconcile a couple things here. Um, what you just said with what well, you do write in the book about how negative emotions can actually be guiding you towards a better version of yourself um, if you follow your integrity. And I think that's the big if, right? If you follow your integrity. So can you kind of um, integrate that the thought with um, what we we're just talking about? Well, the negative feelings are always things that are there to show you your blind spots. So uh, you're doing your best, you know, if you're like most people, you're doing your level best to be a good person and to be successful every minute of your day. But you have, you've been taught things that aren't exactly true for you because nothing can be exactly true for everybody. Mm -hmm. So there are places where you're going to have blind spots. And as you feel the negativity of those things, it's a steering mechanism. It's like rumble strips on the highway. They put those um, they, they corrugate the asphalt on the shoulder of the road so that if somebody goes to sleep and you drift over to the shoulder, mm -hmm. it goes tuh, 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 and it wakes you up. Right, right, I, I, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and that's what it's suffering is to me. It's the, it's the guidance mm -hmm. mechanism of the human psyche and the human body for that matter. And so there's, there's a time when stress feels good. You can have positive stress like working out. But if something hurts you, it's telling you stop. It's really simple. It's just stop. And in that way, suffering is our greatest ally. It's telling us all the time. And it can tell us at very fine levels of discrimination, whether something's good or bad for us. Now I get to the point where if I have the slightest twinge, I'm like, my whole philosophy is cave early. When you're, when you start to suffer immediately, <laughs> just, well, I give up uncle. No, I won't do that anymore. And it, it puts you on a really rapid course toward happiness, strangely enough. Mm. That's so, that, yeah, that's so interesting. But you don't let things spiral downward is another way of putting it. Or if you do, you just, and you will, because you have illusions and because not, you won't always have the same amount of effort uh, or energy. But the beauty of it is the more you spiral down, the worse it hurts. So mm. at a certain point, it becomes unbearable. True. <laughs> and then you pull your hand out of the fire. Unless you're very considerate, uh, you want to really please your parents and you just let yourself burn alive. That's powerful. That's powerful. Um, so if you uh, um, have the integrity and it goes against the grain of the culture. Now, it's not, you're not, it's not always going to be the case, right? Like you're not, it's not like integrity is equivalent to going against the grain of the no. culture, right? No, like, no, but, no. But sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Won't everyone hate you? How can you mentally have a mindset that's that's productive when you go against the grain of culture and, and you're the kind of person who likes to be liked well uh in my case and i am i was born such a massive people pleaser when i mm -hmm. finally pulled my hand out of the fire when i was so sick i could barely move and i realized i had to mm -hmm. find my integrity i was raised very mormon and i was living in a the community i'd grown up in i went off to harvard i had when my son was born i moved back to utah because I knew everybody would agree with me that Down syndrome wasn't such a bad deal. Um, but then I was surrounded by the people I'd grown up with and they were all Mormon. And as I started looking for the deepest truth in my soul, I saw I didn't believe what they believed. And I actually mm -hmm. left the Mormon church, which is the only sin that they see as being worse than murder. So they took you off the list. I asked to be taken off the list and it took some asking i'll tell you um because yeah. if they take you off they feel like they're condemning your soul to eternal misery yeah, and no big deal. Um, yeah so people <laughs> i all. loved uh i basically lost i decided that for a year i would not tell a single lie and i didn't mm. tell a single lie that year and my, everything fell apart i left mormonism left um academia left every friend i'd ever had my extremely large immediate family um there were, it was complicated i explained it in the book but basically yeah i sort of got cut off from pretty much every source of social feedback i'd had in my life we don't need to go into details but you had some trauma i mean you had some real trauma mm. and abuse 
Yeah. So there was a real, was... real good reason, a really good reason why you left. I want to make that clear. Yeah. My father was a big cheese in the Mormon church. And I, I, he had also sexually abused me as a child. And so when I left, yeah. it was very public and it wasn't just mm. one little church member leaving. It was a big, big deal. And uh, I got death threats. Mm. I got a lot of hate mail. It was very intense. And I always tell people your jo journey to integrity will not be if there if there is any justice in the universe, it won't be as bad as mine's. And mine still set me free. I, I started getting here. Better. You are. Here I am. Yeah. And I wasn't it, it was incredibly painful in the way that I suppose surgery without anesthesia would be incredibly painful. It's different mm. from infection. What I had felt mm. like it was toxic and infecting me. And then yeah. the pain of getting back into my integrity was like a, a surgery that was extremely painful, but I knew it was helping. And so there was a sort of um, rightness to it almost. And I went through the grieving. I went through the center of hell and out the other side. And then here we are. I mean, wow, <laughs> what a journey of self-actualization mm. uh, it's been for you and your in your own life. You've almost had to fight for your self-actualization. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. For, for, for periods, uh, protect it, protect it. Yeah, I went and learned karate, actually, literally. <laughs> I was uh, to get the... Wow. Yeah, to get the fear out of my body, I went and... Of course. Uh, and got some belts. <laughs> I have so many follow-up questions, but I, you know, I, we don't have that, that much time, but I, I feel like I want to coach you. <laughs> oh, you're so wanna... nice. <laughs> in a, a watered-down fashion, people, it may not be that they're, they're it's so dramatic in, in how they uh, need to go against their environment, but there may be many cases, as you talk about in your book, where people, uh, the environment won't, won't let people be true to themselves. So like if a family holds different views or the boss is impossible or um, you don't have enough money to do what you want to do, um, what's your advice to people in, in holding true their integrity in, 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 in those in situations as well? Well, the first thing is don't lie to yourself. It, mm. If you realize that your culture, the people around you aren't doing, I always compare it. I like to go to extremes logically. At the end of my year of not lying at all, I thought if I were living in Germany during the World War II and I was hiding Jews in the basement and the Gestapo came mm. and quizzed me, I would have lied to them and felt moral. So there's this, mm. if you're in an insane system, you may not want to march r around proclaiming your beliefs. I mean, one example is um, people of color in America. I had people, uh, friends come to me after I wrote this book and saying, you know, there's a lot less latitude for speaking your mind if you're a person of color in this culture. And I was like, oh my gosh, you are so right. Um, so you, but you want to know you like for a person of color in this culture to be careful and avoid racists and avoid like getting hurt by racists. That is integrity, but it's also integrity to knowing your absolute heart, mind, cells that racism is wrong and that you are no mm. less worthy than any other kind of person. So don't mm. lie to yourself. That's the first thing. The second thing is there are a couple of ways. One I call the Monte Cristo approach. The Count of Monte Cristo was kept in a dungeon mm -hmm. and he dug his way out through solid rock with a spoon over 14 years. So keep working towards your liberation, even if it's you can only do a little a day. And another metaphor for that is what I call one degree turns, where if you're in a plane and you're going 10,000 miles and every half hour you just turn it a d one degree north, no one will notice the change, but you'll end up in a really different spot. So keep heading toward your authenticity, your integrity, even if it's just one degree at a time, little shifts, 10 minutes a day spent doing what you love instead of what other people want you to do. It. Yeah, it adds up. I love that. I must say, Martha Beck, you have lit my brain up. Uh, <laughs> look, look, look behind me. Yay! <laughs> His brain is lit. I love it's it. It's a miracle. But you were you were enlightened before. Well, you know that's the other thing that that um, Dante says at the end of the Paradiso that things happen with this miraculous, benevolent, wonderful uh, magic kind of. And 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you do start to see the world that way for sure. I don't know how you made dead bulbs come alive, but you did. <laughs> I, I just love it. I love how lit up the brain is and I love how lit up you are. I just, I think you're so wonderful. I love your work so much. Thank you, Martha. Oh, that, that, oh, <laughs> that just made my, I'm going to, I'm going to text Andrew right now and be like, can you believe what Martha just said about me? But thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I just, I really appreciate your authenticity and, uh, and just, uh, openness to the world. And, uh, uh it's hard, a hard one, hard one, you know, in a lot of ways and, it's and you've done it. Such yeah. a joy to come yeah. on. And I'm so uh, grateful for your work and everything you put into the world. It's, it's really, um, made my life richer. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.